uh, my brother-in-law and I, Ange, Angelo and Zidio, uh, we decided we'd, we're going to sell pots and pans. <laughs> and we, we were taking a break at the Brown Derby on uh, across from Pearl City. And we looked up a, a window across the street and there was a guy sitting up there. So we wondered what, uh, what he was doing. Went up there and he says he was, had businesses for sale. We asked him about what he had, and he had this, uh, it was, heaven, uh, was uh, Houston's Grocery on Linwood Avenue. So we went up there, and my father went with me. And uh, he said, uh, uh, we talked about buying the place, the business. My father says, no, he said, you buy the building and all. And uh, that's how we happened to get into Linwood Dairy anyway. He helped us with the finance, and uh, his, my brother-in-law's father helped him with the finance. And uh, we were there for 50 years. And you had everything. I mean, it was from the... Oh, we sold everything from paint to toys and groceries mostly, but a little bit of meat. So I remember the counter there. And I remember, of course, is you, you had the, uh, sold the baseball cards, and that was... Oh, yeah, baseball. I still got the boxes from those baseball cards. You should have never said that. <laughs> I should never have said that? <laughs> to me. Oh. <laughs> we'll talk later. Yeah. Uh, you were born here. Tell me about your mother and, and mom and dad. What, 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 were they, what did they do for a living? Well, I was born on, uh, at, on home, at home at uh, 415 Foot Avenue. I lived there all my life except for the time that I went to the service. And uh, my father was a, uh, had a shoe store there. Before that, he was a foreman at uh, Broadhead Worsted Mills. And uh, uh, he, he had the shoe store for uh, right up until he died. Then my sister and I ran it for a while. My sister mostly, because yeah. she was there. But uh, it was, we, we remember when Fort Avenue was a dirt road with a railroad track running up the middle. Really? And then they paved it. We remember watching them pave it with the bricks. And these guys on their, on their all fours setting these bricks with little leather pieces on their fingertips to, to uh, keep their fingers, you know, their heads. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it was a long time ago. <laughs> well, 92 years ago you were born Today, happy birthday. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, 92 years, 92 long years. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. I had recently bought a new car. Yeah. A new car, uh, it was a used car, it was a 1939 DeSoto. And uh, we were out for a Sunday ride. We got up as far as Carl Berg's farm on uh, Stillwater Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the radio on and it said something about Pearl Harbor. So we turned around and went right home to listen to the radio. And uh, that's when we heard so much about the, uh, the Japanese attack on, on Pearl Harbor. I was drafted in, in uh, the fall of 1942, and I was in until the, uh, January of 46. I listened at the Fenton Mansion in uh, Brooklyn Square. No kidding. And then I was taken to, uh, I was taken, I went through a physical, and then uh, taken to Niagara, Fort Niagara for induction. And from Fort Niagara, we went to Miami for basic training. Miami, we were, I was sent to uh, somewhere in Missouri, Sedalia or Malden, I'm not going to remember for sure, and uh, got into uh, uh, training for Air Force. Mm -hmm. But then, then they decided to send us to uh, Paris, Texas for infantry training. We were down there for two or three months. Then they sent me back to uh, Conway, Arkansas for uh, uh, training. It was at Hendricks College. And uh, we were there for several months. 
And then they decided to send me back to Sedalia, Missouri for training on C-47s. And that's where I got uh, uh, my training for the C-47 transport planes. Training, we, sent, we were sent to Miami. And from Miami, they, we weren't assigned yet. Uh, Miami, we went to, uh, they put us on, on a big airplane, a, a four engine plane. It was like a C-47, except it was a four engine. And uh, I don't remember the model. Uh, they sent us to, uh, from Miami to uh, French Morocco, or French uh, Guinea, New Guinea in North Africa. And from, from New Guinea to, uh, went to Natal, Brazil. And from Natal, Brazil, they took us over to uh, Western Africa. And from Western Africa, went up to Tripoli. From Tripoli to Cairo. From Cairo to Iran. Iran to Karachi. Karachi to Calcutta, and from, Cal from Calcutta to Bamo, Burma. But we were assigned, we were there for assignment in Calcutta, and I was assigned to the first air commandos. And uh, that was a transport group that was, uh, at the time, uh, the, the Japanese had taken control of the Burma Road, which is a main source of supply to the uh, Flying Tigers. And, uh, so we had to supply the Flying Tigers by flying gasoline through the Hamilia Mountains. And uh, we would fly uh, stuff to the outposts, the British outposts. And uh, mostly drop your belly packs because they didn't have airstrips. But if they did have a, a, a enough room to land, we would land at a... a, a British outpost and shut off one, the left engine to unload, unload as fast as we could and got out of there as fast as we could. But uh, it was, uh, I never had any problems to speak of. We lost one, one plane in our, in our squad and it was 16 planes, but 15 were in the air at all times. I was a, a crew chief. What was, the, what was the job of the crew chief? Well, if it was carrying paratroops, I had to get the paratroops off the plane. Right. If it was carrying supplies, that was my job to uh, push them out the door or to drop the belly packs. They had a green warning light right by the uh, entrance of the plane. And the, the, uh, et the uh, navigator would signal me when to, when to drop the packs. So I would drop them. And if we dropped paratroops, it was my job to pull the shrouds back in. Uh, we did drop paratroops on Rangoon, and uh, uh, the, the, we dropped the, the uh, troops that we dropped were uh, Gurkha Indians. I don't know if you've ever heard of them or not. There was a tribe of Indian, uh, of Indian and Burmese people. They're very short, and uh, so they couldn't reach the shroud line on the ceiling that we had. So I had to improvise a shroud line along the floor so they could hook up and jump. And they would not jump unless a white man jumped first. So they all had a, a British leader that would uh, jump first. And uh, they retook Rangoon. And shortly after that, the atomic, the atomic bomb was dropped. Wow. And that's when the war ended. But uh, they would jump, and uh, it was the most colorful sight I ever saw. All the different colored parachutes. Every parachute, every color meant a different thing. We were in the air, I think, 16 hours. You would actually open the door. You'd open well, the we didn't fly with the door on. Really? You had to fly with the door off. How high would you fly? What, what was your altitude? Well, the plane was built to go 16,000 feet, but going through the Himalayas, we had to go to 21,000. And the engines would really just, you know, they were really noisy, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, the Himalayas were 25 to 27,000 yeah. feet. You'd fly through the middle, you had mountains on both sides of you. You have, your base was where? Where, where were Bam you? Bamo, Burma. Okay, and the ultimate goal was to what? To fly gasoline mostly mm -hmm. over to the uh, Flying Tigers. Right. For every gasoline we flew over, we burned a gallon. <laughs> <laughs> but it was evidently the only way to get gas to them. 
because uh, the Burma Road was so uh, occupied. Was to break down the wall, reopen the Burma Road, and deliver our merchandise via the back door. This done, we could help build up a portion of the Chinese army to a point where it would be effective in engaging the big Jap force, which now holds a large part of China, as well as assisting in the liberation of her ports. Twin engine, and 250 horsepower each engine. The plane itself was, uh, had a wingspan of 90 feet, and the, uh, the fuselage was 75 feet long. It was capable of carrying a jeep and a trailer, mm -hmm. along with a crew. It, had a, it weighed 15,000 pounds and had a, a, a payload of 15,000 pounds. Uh, one engine would fly, but uh, not at a very high altitude. Right. We had one engine fire, but it, uh, we got down and extinguished. It had, had extinguishers built right into the engine. Oh, yeah, uh, they had, they had, we used to call them gooks. Gooks? But uh, they were uh, natives that would crush rock to build the runways. Ah. And uh, they, they were mostly women, native women that would crush the rock by hand by hitting one rock against another. Then they would lay these rocks out on the runway and uh, cover them with a, a metal, a metal uh, I forget what they called them, but they were made out of metal. They would set these down and anchor them. They would become our runways. But generally, just one runway in one direction, that was it. How long was a runway? How long was it? You mean, yeah. It was less than a mile. Okay. It took, a uh, plane didn't take off, a uh, plane would take off at between 80 and 90. So we had to get up speed uh, uh, within, within less than a mile. Yeah. His name was Joe Speroni. Yeah. Uh, he was a uh, radio operator. But uh, he, was, he, he got over there. He trained in, in the same areas that I did. Mm -hmm. But when we got over there, he uh, was afraid of flying. Well, if they were afraid of flying, they didn't like to put him on a crew, so they were going to ship him out. You know, he shipped out with a, uh, uh, a C-47. That's the C-47 that we lost. And uh, he was killed in that, that accident. Okay. And we searched for several days for him, but there was no sign of him. In the jungles, it was very difficult to find. How did you feel through this whole process? Did you feel? Oh, it was just part of living every day. It, right. just, it, uh, it didn't bother us at all. Most of the time, I was just reading instruments for the pilots. Right. And on the ground, it was just maintaining the plane. I was responsible for the plane. We had a, a line chief that would tell us if there was something wrong on the plane, how to repair it, and we would do that. Pull the cowling, every, every, if I remember right, it was every 25 hours we had to pull the cowlings off the plane to inspect the engines and the different, the uh, tension on the cables and stuff like that. Oh, this is the air metal with two oak leaf clusters. That means it was issued to me three times. Every 250 hours in the air, you were awarded a medal. And I was awarded this medal three times. I had 800 and some hours. Really? And uh, if I'd had another 150 to 160 more hours, I would have been automatically shipped back home. But the war ended before I got to that point. We came back on a banana boat, United U.S. fruit and banana boat. Really? <laughs> yeah. uh, it was low water level in, uh, in our uh, bedding. But it took us 30 days to get back. Uh, we came up through the Suez Canal, you know, across the Mediterranean, and in through the uh, Straits of Gibraltar. And we got onto the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it was the worst storm in history in the Atlantic, and we just bobbed up and down. And uh, actually, one day we went backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the captain swore that he was going to burn that bone out if he had to get us home for Christmas, but he didn't make it. Yeah. We got home uh, a couple of days before New Year's. Yeah. And we were processed and discharged at uh, Fort Dix uh, in, in January 1946. When we were processed in Calcutta, 
they uh, asked us where we were going. They would send us to a specific tent. Well, I got sent to this particular tent, and I was the only one there. So I took a bunk in the corner. I think they slept 16 people. But I was the only one there, so I took a corner bunk. It wasn't long that another guy comes in, and he takes a corner bunk in the exact opposite corner. And I looked at him, I said, you look familiar. He said, I said, where are you from? He said, Jamestown, New York. Well, I said, I'm from Jamestown. They were, that's the way they were categorizing us. Yeah. So we got to talk. His, full name was, his name was Phil Camarada. Okay. And he lived on uh, Barrow Street. He was married. So uh, we became friends, and uh, we came all the way home from, uh, from Fort Dix. We took the train together. And when we got to Jamestown Railroad, uh, the station, uh, we took the same cab. I says, take him home first because he's married. So we took him home, and then uh, uh, the taxi took me back to my home. My father was in the shoe store fitting a pair of shoes on a lady. And when he saw me, he jumped up and came in the house and left the lady in there. <laughs> but uh, it was all was celebration from there on. What did your mother say? Oh, she, was, she, she broke down and cried. Yeah. She was... Pretty happy. If you think about it, there's no real way to communicate your timing or anything else. I mean, no, no. It was, uh, it was just a happy time. Yeah. Well, we're just happy. To, we're just happy to be back. We celebrated for three months. <laughs> yeah, celebrated. <laughs> we, my brother-in-law didn't do it. He was discharged the day before I was, and uh, we celebrated for three months. Different families all had parties for us and. And uh, it was, it was, then we decided we'd better get back to work. <laughs> that's when we started selling pots and pans. Yeah. And that's how we happened to be at the Brown Derby. And uh, we saw this uh, man up in this office, as I said before. And we went up and talked to him. He ended up with Linwood Dairy. Yeah. It was Houston's grocery at the time. But we had a time getting a, hard time getting service because uh, there was another grocery store right across the street. Really? And uh, uh, they refused to service us because they were servicing him. So my brother-in-law bought a, a pickup truck, a uh, sedan delivery truck it was. We used to go to Buffalo, buy our own supplies. And we did that for several months till the guy across the street went out of business. And when he went out of business, why, uh, uh, one of the uh, guys they were servicing him came to us and said that he'd be willing to service us. Oh, sorry. And uh, uh, well, from then on, like I say, everything just fell in place. Buy supplies for the British uh, when we weren't flying gasoline, and uh, we were flying. The British had a, a ration of liquor and beer, and we used to fly these uh, supplies to these outposts. And lots of times, a case of the liquor and some sort of the beer or something would disappear. <laughs> so uh, our commanding officer got a letter from the uh, uh, head, head man and said uh, that this, these procedures had to stop. So he put that, took that letter and read it to us, then he put it in his pocket. And he says, anybody that flies beer or liquor and doesn't get any is is, you know, crappy. <laughs> <laughs> so those are your orders. Yeah, the, we were told to take some. <laughs> we'll be shoved a case or two in the uh, tool, tool room. Yeah. There was a tool room in the back of the plane. So that was part of the return trip. Yeah. So you drop it off, and then it'll be a little bit, and you have supply off depot. All but a couple of cases, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they used to party after that. <laughs> yeah. And you were assigned to one plane? I was assigned to 695, yeah. Did you have a name on the side of the plane? <laughs> I did, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very pleasant. I was ordered to take it off. <laughs> well, tell us now. It's how many years? <laughs> uh, we call it the Big Snatch because it was a, a, <laughs> it was a uh, uh, glider pickup plane. It was the only one in the squadron that had a pickup facility. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, well, I was told to take it off anyway. We had an artist in the camp 
that painted this picture on the, on the nose of the plane and then put the, the name on the bottom. Yeah. And they, uh, we were told to take it off. So. Well, that was probably by the British because you were snatching the liquor. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should look back today. This is December 7th, 2013. Your birthday, your 92nd birthday. Congratulations. Um, it also obviously is Pearl Harbor Day as well. well. It's, it's an experience I would never have given up. Yeah. It, uh, and I look back, uh, I, I saw things that I would never would have seen otherwise. And uh, it was, it was a, a real interesting, uh, like I say, I saw so many parts of the world that many people don't get to see. Like I say, I vowed when I went into service that I wasn't gonna go back to a factory Right. And uh, it was an experience I would never, ne never have had, seeing all these countries and uh, uh, it was just quite an experience anyway. Jeff, this has been great. I'm just so well, thrilled. I hope it's been informative. Oh, incredibly so. Okay, well, it's good to, good to talk to you. Good to talk to you and happy birthday. Thank you. Thank great. you.